and welcome to day two of Income Protection Awareness Week. If you're joining us for your second session, welcome back and thank you. And if you didn't make yesterday's session, fear not, you can catch up on all the content via our website and YouTube channel. So today's theme is mortgages and the important role that mortgage advisors have in highlighting income protection to their clients. A mortgage is a huge undertaking and represents a point in a person's life when they're often thinking seriously about their finances for the first time. There cannot be a better time to talk about the need to protect income to those taking on debt and a huge financial commitment. In fact, when you put it like that, don't we have a responsibility to include it in our conversations? But what's the best way to do this? What tools can help advisors convey the value of income protection policy to their clients? Well, over the next hour, we hope to answer these questions for you and hopefully inspire you to take the first step in identifying the best place to start and tools that will help you. We're going to hear from Vincent O'Connor about why we need to rethink mortgage protection. We have a couple of advisors lined up to share their stories about how they've changed their focus and improved their IP sales. And finally, we'll be mining the expertise of our panel to identify some top tips. So let's get started with our presentation from Vincent O'Connor from The Right Mortgage. Vincent, over to you. Thanks, Joe. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my short presentation, Why Mortgage Clients Need You to Talk to Them About Income Protection. My name is Vincent O'Connor, and I'm Head of Protection here at the Right Mortgage and Protection Network. And we're delighted to be supporting this really superb initiative, the Income Protection Awareness Week by the IPTF. So well done, Katie, Joe, Andrew, and the rest of the team. In my short introductory session, I'd like to stake a case for why mortgage clients really do need you to talk to them about income protection. Now, to set the tone for this very short session, take a listen to Angry Mike. He's about to phone his advisor because he's had some bad news. Hi, John speaking. John, it's me, Mike. You came to see us about a year ago. You arranged a mortgage. Oh, hi, Mike. Nice to hear from you. How are you? To be honest, not the best. I've just come out of the hospital, can you believe? I've just had surgery on my back and it's going to keep me off work for months. Oh no, what happened? Well, not sure really. I was just at work one day, bent over to pick something up and my <coughs> back just went. I was in agony. I couldn't get up. An ambulance actually had to take me to the hospital and I had to have surgery up to repair some of the discs. There's nerve damage too. Nightmare, really. God, it sounds like it. How long are you going to be laid up for then? Well, they're not sure at the minute, but at least three months, might be more. I'm going to need physio, and I think I'm going to have to take things easy for a lot longer than that. Yeah, definitely. But listen, the reason for the call today, John, is that, you know, I'm self-employed. I work for myself. And if I can't work, I don't earn any money, obviously. And when you arranged our mortgage last year, you came back to talk to us about our insurances. Yeah, that's right, I did. Well, I've just took a look at my bank statement and I'm paying 68 quid a month for an insurance policy. I think it's what you call mortgage protection. Okay, let me just get your file out. Yeah, here we go. So you and your wife have got, yeah, mortgage protection insurance. So that's life cover and it also includes some critical illness cover and that's for both of you. Oh, thank God for that. That's a relief. We may lose my income. I'm going to need a bit of help to pay me mortgage for a few months. Uh, well... I'm, I'm afraid your policy can't actually help with that. It's it's just life cover and critical illness cover. Your condition with your back isn't what the insurance companies call a critical illness. So you're saying I can't use it? I can't make a claim? No, I'm really sorry. I'm afraid you can't. So how is it? Mortgage protection then? On the mortgage offer that you give me, it says your home is at risk and you can't keep up payments on your mortgage. I've got it in front of me. I can't believe it because I can't pay it if I've lost my income. Are you tell me there isn't an insurance for that? Yeah, the, there is. It's called income protection. It, it replaces your income or a proportion of it if, if you can't work. All right, then. What does that mean, though? I don't think you mentioned that to me. And where am I paying all this money for every month for a mortgage protection if I can't even use it? I reckon you should have told us about that, mind. Listen, I'm not happy about this, John, at all. We don't have a lot of savings. We're going to have to make some serious cutbacks. Probably starting with that mortgage protection you sold us. 
Can't believe how angry I am here. I don't want to talk about it. I'll have to phone you back. So what did you think of that? Was it realistic? Could a phone call like that ever actually take place? And how would you feel if it was one of your clients phoning you? From one point of view, the advisor in that call clip did do a good job because the client did have decent levels of protection, but clearly there was still a gap. And it's not really clear whether there was ever a proper conversation about income loss. One of the reasons for this whole campaign is that as an industry, we do need to do better when it comes to income protection. We do really well advising life cover and critical illness cover. And yes, there are reasons which will preclude some of our clients from having access to income protection. But at the same time, we've never seen such a rich tapestry of income protection solutions on the market today. These can cater for so many more of our clients and indeed their budgets. So when reality bit Mike, our client, he wasn't happy. Now, I think it's important that each client is put in an informed position about the protection risks they face. And that means keeping things simple, keeping things understandable so that they have the very best chance to buy into the argument that we're trying to present. For me, personal protection means two things. It means repay the mortgage and it means lifestyle. When we're talking about mortgage, that could also be debts and loans and other things like that. Lifestyle, well, that simply means being able to do the things that you want to do individually and as a family. It means bring up the children, go on holiday, pay the bills and have a decent standard of living. Now, if you look at that recommendation for Mike, and let's say he has a partner called Karen, you can see here that a life or earlier critical illness policy taken out on a joint life basis for mortgage protection certainly does tick a few boxes, but there are still plenty of risk areas left unaddressed. And of course, the risk for sickness and incapacity, that was left completely exposed, which is why we ended up with an angry client. Now let's remind ourselves about some of those risk statements that you'll see on mortgage illustrations and on mortgage offers. I've captured just a few. Your home is at risk if you're unable to keep up your mortgage payments or other loans secured against it. Make sure you can afford your mortgage if your income falls. Your income may change. Please consider whether you'll still be able to afford your monthly repayment installments if your income falls. And finally, your home may be repossessed if you do not keep up repayments on your mortgage. What's the common theme on each of these risk statements? Keep up repayments and income. Perhaps using that, we've got an opportunity now to redefine what we mean by mortgage protection. In fact, what should mortgage protection actually mean? Protect the mortgage? It seems to me that there's something slightly out of sync here. We know that we use a lot of jargon in our industry, but very often that doesn't mean anything to our clients. So mortgage protection, as far as our industry is concerned, what do we typically think of? We might think of it as a product, life or critical illness cover, paying a lump sum over the mortgage term, either level or decreasing. And the objective, pay off the mortgage. But mortgage protection, as far as our clients are concerned, what should it mean? Perhaps an insurance solution, yes. But really, if something bad happens, we don't lose our home, as per those risk statements. Seems a bit disjointed to me that when we typically deploy a mortgage protection solution, it's very often the nuclear option that doesn't just help them keep up the mortgage and monthly payments, it completely pays it off. And there's nothing wrong with that. But here's an idea. When talking to mortgage clients and then trying to bring in the importance of the protection conversation, why not lean on the regulator? You can explain that regulation is a really good thing as far as the client's concerned, and that's because it protects clients and it maps out rules that advisors must follow to deliver the highest level of service and care. So you can explain to clients that we have a regulatory responsibility to talk about the risks associated with taking out a mortgage. That means a duty of care to you. And that's to make sure that should the worst happen, you and your family, you don't lose your home. Obviously, we'll work hard with our clients to help them buy the home by way of the mortgage, but it also makes sense to make sure they don't lose it too. Therefore, we need to have a conversation about what those risks are. So lean on the regulator by referring to those risk statements which appear on the mortgage documentation. You can tell them that these statements appear on all mortgage illustrations and on mortgage offers. And they're written by the regulator of financial services, the FCA. These are very important statements and they link back to your duty of care. 
that means we need to have a conversation about what those risks are. So you can ask your clients, what are the risks that could potentially stop you from keeping up your mortgage repayments? Now, if you've asked that question, what do you think they'd say? If they haven't been asked that question before, they might need a few moments to consider their answer. But what could stop you from keeping up your monthly mortgage payments? Lose the job? Lose their income? OK, so what could cause you to lose your job? They might say redundancy. OK, well, perhaps you could get another job. So to a degree, that is in your control. But what else? What other things could stop your income? You could have an accident or become sick, but that's not in your control. And it could cause you and your family big financial problems. So fundamentally, it's all about income. It's about losing income and not having enough money to pay that mortgage. When you ask that question, they will be able to answer it. And of course, you'll be able to give them the actual chances of claims using the various protection risk tools that we're talking about this week. So why do mortgage clients need you to talk to them about income protection? Well, they need an expert like you to put income protection firmly on the agenda and have that conversation about it. We know they won't do it themselves if they're left to their own devices. So thank you for listening. Hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Thanks for supporting the IPTF and obviously this campaign this week. Some great ideas there from Vincent, suggesting how advisors can highlight how income protection meets the requirements laid out in the mortgage T's and C's. Listening to Angry Mike, I'm sure that's a call that no advisor wants to receive. So the case for including income protection in your conversation gets stronger and stronger. As Andrew mentioned yesterday, there are some fantastic protection specialists in the UK and they're doing a great job. This week, though, we want to inspire those advisors who either don't currently sell IP or don't feel particularly confident in doing so. With that in mind, we spoke with a couple of advisors who began selling IP or altered their focus to change the way they sell IP fairly recently. We asked them if they could share their stories and top tips and what's made the difference for them. So now we'll hear firstly from Will Shackleton and then from Kate Stratton. My name's Will Shackleton and I am a mortgage and protection advisor with First Mortgage Services in York. Um, I've been in the industry now for five years, the last two of which I have been with uh, First Mortgage Services. Um, my background in selling protection uh, was uh, very limited before I came uh, before I came to work with Julie and the team and that was mainly because where I was working at the time um, I was just employed as a uh, as a mortgage advisor we had a separate department at the time that would take on the, the referrals and they would they would provide the advice it was just for us to take up essentially so when I joined um, first mortgage services it was it was very much uh, a steep learning curve for me to to, to pick up um, how to one approach the subject to um, get people's interest into it and make sure that they really understood um, fortunately at the time julie and the rest of the team were putting together a quite a robust way uh, a process for for sales for for us and for existing advisors and any other advisors that we took on which really did help um, but to try and help myself what i did was go to um, the different providers uh, pages and sort of worked out what additional benefits and what other you know what made these policies sort of stand out from any of the other ones in in the market the ones that were on the zenith panel at the time um, and i started start, started to think that the the, the best you know the, what not necessarily just the product itself but the other bits and pieces that were offered um, might actually just help people understand and, and just create a bit more value to it, which I've sort of found a bit, which was a lot easier to, to sort of engage people with. So for the likes, just as a quick example, the likes of LV and Royal London having fracture cover, um, it, all of a sudden you're getting this additional amount within your premium, um, as well as additional support as well. And, and it creates a lot more value to it. All of a sudden it's like, oh, well, it's not just that it's this as well um which people got really engaged with um so so really going down that sort of route when i'm sat with a client it, it really helped me keep their interest and 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 make them understand more about the product um 
another thing when you start sort of working out different tools that you've got at your, at, at your disposable um, risk reality calculators. I mean, I use all these. There's there's various other ones that are, that are not produced by um, providers, but will give you pretty much the same result as well that you can go to um, sitting sitting with a client in front of them um, with the different options that they've got available to them um, really sort of engages them a lot more. They realise that the statistics are quite high when they're going to want to need it and, and sort of helps bolster your your sort of point when you when you're talking to them about what it is that they, they they need from the policy and what it's going to do for them um another thing that um came out uh almost i think a bit over a year ago which i sort of engaged with quite a lot was through pipeline having the um having the benefits tool there that you can use um which you can go in you i think you pick your fat your top five providers um either your cheapest or another five that you want to compare against each other and you can pick different different added benefits so for the likes of uh, fracture cover or uh, counseling services physiotherapy in the way of um, international treatment as well uh, and then it, it'll sort of grade them all um, in a percentage about who does it better so for me that was really helpful with compliance and that point of view um the reason that i sort of I try and push income protection a lot more is because there's when you sort of look at the statistics of everything there's a much higher likelihood of, of you of your client needing to use it so um when you when from a moral point of view you're doing the best for your client but also from a selfish point of view you're almost protecting yourself because you're not inviting any anybody to come and try and make a claim against you you have provided everybody with that advice and given them as much possible information as, as they can need to make that to make that decision for themselves um i mean commercially you sort of do a really good job and walk everybody through it hold the hand almost like you would do with any mortgage it's going to lead to, you know, hopefully it'll lead more to more leads and it'll generate more avenues of business for you to, to go into, to go, to go and help other family, you know, to other, other clients, families, and, and uh, et cetera. Um, and in terms of, uh, having to, having any clients that have needed to use their policy, I, I haven't really had, uh, I haven't had that experience yet. I came fairly close recently and a client of mine, we just completed the mortgage. We we sort of just before that started opening the um, the sort of dialogue for the for the insurances, and unfortunately the mortgage well the mortgage completed. She came she came to me and unfortunately she was going through she's going through some treatment um, for quite a serious illness, um, so we wouldn't be able to get any cover for her, unfortunately. But I did sort of just highlight to her, you know, there's there's still the need for her partner to to get protection for himself, which they've obviously really engaged in because of what's going on with her so having all these different things to your to your uh, in your arsenal the risk reality calculator um the comparisons for the different benefits of the products as well as presenting the information in a really easy and concise way for the client either through an option sheet or just in an email just telling them what these different things are going to do uh, has really helped me uh, and really helped my clients because they can constantly refer back to it. Hi everyone, I'm Kate Stratton, the owner of Home Mortgage Solutions and I've been a mortgage advisor for approximately seven years now. The thing I love most about my job is helping a client get one step closer towards owning their dream home, whether that be first time buyers or home movers. My protection journey has been slightly different to some people's. I've never really struggled about having a conversation regarding protection or bringing up all the awful things that could potentially happen to a client during their lifetime and talking about the different ways that we can look after them to make sure they don't have any financial worries during that time. The thing that held me back was that actually I was probably too passionate about critical illness cover and not as passionate about income protection. Due to some past personal issues that I've had, I kind of valued critical illness cover more than income protection and I think that came across in all of my conversations with customers. My network is Stonebridge and they ran a protection masterclass and Ian from Legal in General came on and gave us lots of tips and hints and tricks and tried to really make us think about the way that we deal with income protection and have that conversation with a client. What I realised was that actually I did need to change the way I did things. And by doing so, it would help me show the customer that it's just as important as critical illness cover. 
In a first appointment, all we discuss as mortgage advisors is a fat find about that customer and we look at their income and their outgoings. The tangible outcome of that is that actually, Mr. Client, you can buy this sort of property, which is realistically the bit that they're there for, and it's the bit that they want to know the most. We can only get to that outcome once we know how much they earn. So surely as a mortgage advisor, we should be looking at protecting those earnings no matter what. Because actually, if we took that income away, then they wouldn't be buying that house with us today. I switched up my first appointments and made my first appointments concentrate on income protection. So I'd link that income to income protection straight away. So they knew first and foremost that it was probably the most important thing that they could discuss alongside their mortgage. We have a duty of care as mortgage advisors because we make people's dreams a reality, but we also need to make sure that they stay that way. So quite often after a first appointment, we would then have a conversation with a client. So Mr. Customer, um, we've discussed this and because of this, this is what you can uh, you can buy. This is the sort of property that you can look to purchase. Um, but you can only do that because of this income. So actually, if I were to take that income away, there's the chance that you wouldn't be buying this house. And there's a very real possibility that if you're in this house at the time that you lose that income, you won't be staying there. Now, we need to make sure that that doesn't happen to you. So we need to look at some sort of income protection to make sure that that income is always there for you, no matter what, whatever kind of illness or injury you have, you're safe and you're protected. So that really made me change up my insurance conversations and I'd have that income protection conversation from day one all the way through, regularly mentioning it to the client. It never really affected my critical illness cover conversations because I still feel completely passionate about that as well. Um, so it didn't have a detrimental effect on my clients one way or the other. Um, and in actual fact, it meant that they realised the importance of both. That was better in a commercial sense, but also it was doing the right thing for the customer, which is the most important part of our job. We have had, we've all had customers who've had illnesses in the past and things that have happened to them. And the one that maybe all of this brought back memories of was my first ever client who was 23. Her and her partner had bought their first house and they'd moved in together. And I tried to keep in touch with my customer as much as possible. Now, once she'd moved in, we were having a chat on the phone and she was telling me all sorts of things. And one thing that she did say, and I genuinely cannot remember how the conversation started, um, but she was telling me that she'd got a really bad knee and her doctor had told her that she'd got growing pains. Now, obviously, I do not profess to be a doctor in any way, shape or form. And I said to her, it just seems a bit strange because it's unlikely that you're still growing at the age of 23. Um, it may be worth getting a second opinion on it, which was part of her insurance package that she'd taken with us at the time of buying the house. A good few weeks later, she called me back to tell me that actually she'd used second opinion and she hadn't got growing pain. She had actually got a really rare form of bone cancer that had been caught really early thanks to second opinion, which was which was which was brilliant. She had to go into hospital for approximately a year, so she was there for a very long time. But her and her partner had income protection and critical illness cover, and it meant that he could be in hospital with her and sleep there when they let him. Um, he could spend time with her and be there to support her without worrying financially how they were gonna maintain all their bills. Their critical illness cover had paid off their mortgage um, and she could genuinely spend time concentrating on getting better. It means that now, many years later, she's absolutely fine. She's still a customer. She's got children. They've sold their house and bought another one um, and they're married now. So out of the other side of things, it's it's brilliant and her life is is much, much better. It's everything she wanted it to be. She just had to go to hell, through hell to get there. But she did. And thanks to an income protection, critical illness cover policy and second opinion, it's meant that actually she's still here today to tell the tale. So it just reminds us that we have to do the right thing by our customers. And it really does make a huge impact on their lives when we do the right thing. Thank you for listening. So thank you to Kate and to Will for sharing their stories. We hope that hearing how others have increased 
their knowledge and sales of IP and the tools and the techniques that they have found helpful will inspire other advisors watching. Sorry, will inspire other what advisors watching to believe that it's both achievable and worthwhile. Remember, you can access all of the content from this week on our website and listen again to the tips and advice shared. We've also heard from Vincent O'Connor, of course, who challenged us to think about IP as more suitable um, in, in terms of mortgage protection, and in fact, an essential product to include in conversations with mortgage clients. So now to our, our uh, panel discussion, I'm joined on the virtual stage by some experts from the mortgage world. Uh, in the interest of allowing time for our discussion, I'll introduce our panelists and allow them to wave so that those of you watching know who is who. Uh, so firstly, we have Martin Reynolds, who is CEO of Simply Biz Mortgages. Next, we have Angela Davidson, Head of Protection at Mortgage Intelligence. And finally, Sam mm. Marriott, who is Director and Co-Founder of CSE Financial Services. So with such experience at my disposal, I'm keen to get the panel's views on what they've seen so far. So in the interest of time, I wonder if I can ask you all to highlight a key takeaway from the session so far from you. And Sam, perhaps I can start with you. Yeah, I think the key takeaway for me is what um, Kate was saying about the uh, when to introduce that mortgage protection conversation really get it in early. I think far too many mortgage brokers um, currently really wait and do the mortgage side of things first. Obviously, that's what their clients are in for. And then later on down the line, maybe when the application's in or even when on completion, they then start the conversation so much easier, uh, like Kay was saying, get it in right away. You're doing the income and expenditure anyway. It's the perfect time to start talking about the protection side. Yeah, it was clear that putting it front and centre had had a real impact for her, wasn't it? Uh, Martin, can I come to you for your key takeaway? Uh, I think it was also a case in this instance where she said be admitting to be open minded about learning new things and, and not just sticking to your same process that's worked well for her yeah. over many years. But seeing that there's a different way to do something that gets IP uh, a bit further up the process. Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully this week we can inspire uh, advisors to, to pick up some of those tips and try something different. Um, and finally, Angela, I wonder if you concur with your fellow panellists or if you've got a different takeaway. No, I, I do concur. Um, it was Kate for me because um, she knew that she was biased towards critical illness and has a passion for it and there's nothing wrong with that but I thought it was great that she decided to, to change how she approached it so that she also gave enough credence to income protection I thought that was brilliant yeah yeah agreed absolutely um, so moving on to the reason that we're here then I, I wanted to start by asking our panel to consider the advice that they would give to a mortgage advisor uh, out there who's currently not selling much IP, but but is interested in doing so. Um, so Angela, how, how should an advisor start that conversation with their client? Okay, well, I'm, I want to take a step back a little bit. And I think that um, preparation is key. And mortgage advisors, um, nearly everyone I've ever spoken to in, in a long time, they send out a list of um, items that they want the um, client to get a hold of in order to be able to look at the mortgage. And what I would suggest is be upfront and say, look, um, could you also do me a favor and find out what your work benefits are, please? Um, because it's important. I'm not just going to be looking after you now. I'm also going to be looking at after you in the future so a full financial picture is the ideal place to start and it kind of links in with what Sam said it's getting at really early doors um, it's just um, setting their expectations that we're going to be talking about that um, but also to opening up their mind to yeah um, income's really important I need to be checking this out for you um, and it means that when they do get into the fact find, 
they're not starting to say, oh, by the way, do you know what your benefits are? Because nobody does. Or they inflate them or they think that they're, they're going to get paid forever in a day. So it means you're having a more realistic conversation. And I just think it's it's a really good step forward if, if that gets put into the process. Um, then when you're in the fact find, um, I think it's getting an understanding of what protection means to that client. And when I when I talk to advisors, I'll say, look, throw that in as the first question. What do you understand of protection? And it could, you could get any answer. But a, a lot of the time it'll be, oh, do you mean life cover? Yeah, I've heard about that before. And it's a, it's a way of saying, well, actually, yeah, you, you are right. But that, I have to tell you, the good news, that is the least likely thing for you to worry about in the next 30 years. But what's more likely um, to be a concern to you is a spell off work long term. And that's why we're going to be discussing this today, because it's, it's my priority to make sure that you understand the implications of to make sure that you can still keep that roof over your head and food on the table come what may so I think um I think that's a way of of opening up and finding out you know they might have an opinion um on income protection but it's highly unlikely I think it's going to be more of an education piece um and then I guess that the next thing is that people often find it difficult to imagine that they would ever be ill. Nobody sits at home on a night and with a glass of wine and says, yeah, I wonder what would happen if I had a stroke or if I had cancer. Or you, we just don't, human beings don't want to think of those things. So one little um, message that I, I get across to our advisors is this, um, go down the route of um, saying to them, look, um, income protection will protect against illness or indeed an accident. And just for instance, is it fair to say that in the next 30 years, any one of us, including me, could have even say a car accident? And the answer has got to be, well, yeah, in reality, that could happen. And I just think, I think that clients can look at that as a Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. That could happen to me, although illness couldn't, <laughs> but, but an accident could. Um, so I think it helps just to get that into their, um, their mindset that they do need to protect against such things. Yeah, absolutely. So, Martin, uh, Angela's touched on, on it there, but I wonder if I can ask you about conveying the need uh, for income protection to a client. Um, so is it you know, as, as Angela said about convey, uh, highlighting the propensity to need the product. Uh, so how would you suggest advisors can effectively convey need uh, to their clients? I think it's about the positioning as well, isn't it? As Angela touched on some of it there and, and, and what we use and a lot of our members use is that positioning at, at the start of the process about, you know, we, we're going to help you buy your home, but then actually we're going to, we then want to help you stay in your house. You know, so it is it is getting that terminology right. And, and you know, the normal question is, well, what do you mean? You're going to help me staying it. Mm -hmm. And I think that then brings out that need that says, well, the mortgage is only going to help you buy it. But if something happens, how are you going to stay in that house? How, how are you going to be able to continue? And I think that brings the conversation in very early. I think it brings in that questioning maybe from the client of, of what you mean. And and some of the most successful advisors we've seen, um, their, their fact find is very simple. The first question is, what was the purpose of this loan? You know, house purchase, remortgage, further advance, et cetera. The second question is, are you going to protect this loan? Yes or no? Yeah. It's very and, and you've got the buy-in in question too, because the challenge you get and the challenge we get fed back is the customer isn't coming for a mortgage. They're coming to buy a house or to refinance their mortgage, et cetera. So, once they've got to that point, the excitement of the reason they've come to see you is I've got the house. So therefore, the, all the ancillary bits around that, whether it's insurances of, of, of many descriptions, are that challenge. So I think you can get that buy-in early. And then once you've, you've spoken to them about, yeah, looks like we can get you mortgage, you can refer them back to those questions of, you said you were going to protect this mortgage, or remember we were telling about how we can help you stay in your home right, we need to cover that now as part of this. And I think it's, you, you're bringing them back to an early acceptance. And, and a lot of people, once they've said yes, they don't like to change their mind at that point. So you've got that buying to at least get them to listen. 
Yeah. So, then the challenge is getting them to buy, obviously. And 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 you're right. The the bit that we've chatted about is is the cost or perceived cost of income protection when you see it against critical illness or or, or life cover. Um, and again, I think it's talking to the customer around that. That I, there's two things I'd say. The customer doesn't know is expensive or comparatively of expensive because they can't see it on sourcing systems and aggregator sites as much. So they don't know that. That's our perception of yeah. it's expensive. Um, but it's talking to them about the reason there is a higher premium for that than, than life cover is the propensity of people needing it is higher. Therefore, as you'd expect with anything that gets claimed a lot, there will be a, a, a change in pricing. So actually give them that reason and rationale is it is that price because it gets used a lot. Yeah. I think so they can actually start to see the value in that premium straight away. It is something that I'm going to leave, you know, as we say, life insurance is really, really cheap. It's because that perception, as Angela said, we don't think we're going to get ill or pass away. You know, we, we think we're, you know, at that age, when we start to take it out, we, we still think we've got 30, 40, 50 years left in us, don't we? So therefore, actually, that income protection is something that you can bring out that says this could happen, you know, statistically and, you know, there's people like LV, as, uh, as was mentioned in the report, that do those reports that give you those statistics of, of what's going to happen. And I think it is that positioning of that and trying to position away from the cost being expensive to the cost is appropriate because. And I think that just helps position it a little bit better. Yeah, it really highlights the uh, important role of the advisor has to play here in, in not suggesting that this is expensive compared to other products and not suggesting this is complicated, but actually saying this is something you might need. Therefore, let's talk about it. So, so Sam, if we can come to you uh, now. So this week, uh, we're keen to highlight and correct some of the misconceptions held by advisors. Um, in your experience, what are the main misconceptions and how have you managed to remedy these in your own company? Um, I think for, for me, there, there's kind of two main misconceptions with income protection. Uh, the first one, one I think we've just touched on is, is how perceived complicated the income protection can be. I think it's it's just worth remembering that when you first set out in the advice world, no one knew really what critical illness cover was, and you had to just learn that. Um, and it's all product knowledge and, and product based um, and market knowledge. Um, income protection, in in a way, is actually a lot easier than critical illness cover. Um, mainly around the calculation side of things, there's really only one calculation you need to make, and it's very very simple in terms of making that calculation. Uh, whereas critical illness, especially you know, if we move on to family cover and things like that, there's so many different ways of calculating that side of things. Whereas income protection, like you said, you know, straightforward calculation, it's done and dusted there, really. Um, so what I would say, um, especially for anyone who's really wanting to get to, to sell more income protection, is, is really learn the market. Like Will was saying in in his video, get the BDMs out, um, get get the providers out, look on the websites. Um, all it is is just learning. Uh, that's all it is. It's just reading and taking it in. Uh, and I can promise you, like I said, I've done it myself. It's very, very simple once you know what it is. Um, the other misconception I see, uh, which I think Martin was touching on, is that critical illness cover is better for a mortgage than income protection. Now, that's not to say that it has its place, because it certainly does. But what you're effectively saying, if you've got a client with, say, I don't know, £200,000 mortgage, and you do a full life and critical illness cover on that, um, if a client then claims on a on a cancer uh, and they get £200,000 from the critical illness cover, what you're effectively saying as an advisor is you're going to use that to pay off your entire mortgage. Now, reality is that's not going to happen. You're going to probably use that to live off and make sure that obviously family, bills, food, everything's looked after. So what you're effectively then doing is actually using it as an income replacement. Well, then why not use the exact product? income protection that, that, that that's what it's there for so you use that product instead uh, again a lot of critical illness cover is not full either it, it's kind of you know maybe two hundred thousand life and forty thousand illness cover, uh, critical illness cover so again you're using it as an income replacement but just instead of using that product you use the exact product that is there to plug that gap which is income protection um, but the main, the main thing, as, as I kept mentioning, is uh, just make sure you get uh, the BDMs out. Make sure you learn it. I promise you, you spend a couple of hours looking on the website, you're pretty much going to be 90% of the way there anyway. And then talk, talk to people um, who sell it already and you'll be, you'll be quizzing with income protection. I promise you. Good point. And, uh, and of course, quick plug for the IPTF website where we'll uh, 
you know we have all the provider stuff there so uh, that's a good starting point for anyone wanting to know but yeah it's a really good point Sam that if people are going to use critical illness as is income replacement then income protection covers a, a far broader range of conditions so you're better off uh, with that so so Angela coming back to you um, I know that you wanted to highlight the issue of sick pay and how income protection works with sick pay so if someone has for example six months full pay and then a further six months of half pay do they still need to be considering income protection yeah th this is something I talk about all the time because um I think clients think they're set to life set for life if they've got six months full six months half because let's face it that is gold dust nowadays um, and it is really good cover from work. But I also hear a lot of advisors thinking that they're set for life as well with six months full and six months half. And I really think that we've got to take a fresh look at that because um, it is brilliant cover from work, but it's it's not the be all and end all. And I think it's a little bit short sighted to think that that's always going to see these people through. Um, we only have to look at sort of claim stats from our providers to see the average um, duration of a claim. Um, I, I could say a few providers here now, such as um, sort of LV and legal in general from, from last year. You know, you're looking at six years, 11 months for an average claim, and you're looking at um, four years and six years, depending on which provider. But that comes as quite a shock sometimes to even advisors who if you ask them how long do you think people are, are usually off claiming they'll go oh three months and they'll go no that's it's not um if people are going to be ill they can be ill for a long time so that one year safety net that they've got from work is blinking brilliant but it isn't going to see them through if go back to that car accident um example that i gave before if somebody's never going to get back to work again forever is a long time <laughs> getting up to retirement age um so yeah i do think that we should um change our own mindset about yeah it's good cover but if getting something from work but we need to look at the longer vision um the good thing is if somebody's got six months full six months half hell it's going to be cheaper because they're going to have good deferment periods so that's yeah. a really good reason to do it um but also if you're looking at somebody who is going to be taking um, a mortgage up to near retirement let's not forget the stats that came out a few months ago um johnny timpson is always talking about it one in eight people will have to be leave work because of ill health. Mm. Now, even if you leave work early, you know, you retire early, I still think you have to pay your bills and eat. So it would be great to have um, a long sighted view of income protection. People have got these mortgages around the next for a long time. And it could be those later years where it absolutely comes into play as well. So, yes, I, I really do think um, it's something worth considering. Thanks, Angela. Um, Martin, is it fair to say that, that people and, and by people, I mean advisors and, and customers often underestimate the value of IP because they're seeing the monthly payment rather than the big cash sum that, that maybe they associate with, with uh, CI? Um, I wonder how we can challenge advisors thinking here and how we should be thinking about the value of IP. I, th I think it's a mixture of the, the last two answers we've had uh, from Angela and Sam, because you, you've got you've got that bit around my employer will pay something, but then you've got to take into account. And I think as advisors challenge the customer is, so you expect to be working for this company for the next 20 years. Yeah. Because we don't tend to work for the same companies for those length of times or or not as often. So actually, you might take it and you might think that's great now, but in four years time, you've moved job and your employer only gives you three weeks three weeks half so you know you're relying on somebody else to make sure that you're okay and I think in a society we should should take that responsibility more on ourselves as, as mortgage holders ourselves so I think that is part of it is, is doing that so therefore the value of IP comes in and then I think the bit that Sam was picking up is that you know that lump sum if people are using the lump sum of critical illness to do live by but they still got to pay their mortgage it is that understanding of bringing out the stats of six years, actually, what six years of, I don't know, say you've taken a £1,000 a month income protection policy, 
what six and a half years at a thousand pounds a month that then becomes a big lump sum so actually talking to them about you know what is it that you want to do you've paid your mortgage off that's great but you still need to eat you still need you know to clothe your children you still need to survive and and and, and do those things so actually it, it's, it's understanding the mixture of what those protection is and and to me it's it's an inverting the protection sales process on its head which traditionally has started at life maybe kick and then at the bottom you've gone ip invert it the other way around and start with ip one because as we said earlier it happens more often two it helps you continue with your normal day-to-day life on a consistent basis and you're not worried about eating into that capital if it's critical illness if you then got the critical illness then you in the nice way you got that brucey bonus to do pay the mortgage off while still having that that sort of extra bit to to have your monthly so i think it's back to that positioning back to using the data of, of, of stone and then maybe aggregating it to that big lump sum so people can compare and contrast. But I think so it's not seen as a direct debit as well. Is, is that yearly reminder to the customer? This is what your policy is. It's, yeah. it's not just £45 or £50 or whatever it is that's going out from a provider. This is what it is. And, you know, that, that could be great for an advisor to just send that out as a, as a communication bit with a question, you know, how's it going? Oh, you've had a pay rise. You've changed jobs, right? Do do we need to look to top that up? Because ultimately, the earlier you do it, back to the point of you might move job in four years. In four years' time, trying to get IP might be X percentage more expensive because you're four years older and something might have happened as well. So, you know, getting that earlier as well, getting it based in and normal, I think, is the key for me. Yeah, and it, it speaks to the point as well that, you know, often people don't know what cover they've got through their employer. They're, they're assuming that they've got a certain amount of cover. They may or may not have that. And, um, yeah, as you say, the earlier you get it sorted, uh, the better. But it, it's nice if advisors can maintain that relationship and stay in touch so that that policy isn't just bought and put in a drawer or stuffed in the inbox and forgotten about. And, and you can remind them of, of everything else that comes with an IP policy as well. So, so Sam, um, as an advisor um, here on the panel, um, with experience of actually selling IP, I wonder if you could share your, your top sales tip with us. Um, yeah, um, I think for me, it, it's going back to what Martin said early on. Um, it's about selling the value of it. Um, and the way that, that, that I go about it in my conversations um, is by questioning. Um, a, a lot of the, the value is in the questions. And I don't mean just top level questions. I see a lot of advisors start the conversations on, OK, I think I think, you know, most training in IP will start with. So what happens if you're off work due to accident and sickness and the client will then say, oh, I don't know. You know, I don't really have any savings and I think my family are going to be a bit messed up financially. And then they'll reel off all the benefits of income protection. But that that's not getting the client to feel that gap that they have. Um, they know they're aware of it, but if they don't feel that gap, they won't buy into it. And like mine and Angela have been saying, they won't keep it and they won't see the continued value of it. So it's about really asking those deeper level questions of, okay, so what happens if you're off work due to accident or sickness? Well, you know, my family aren't going to be able to afford the mortgage. Okay, so then then what happens? Uh, well, I haven't really thought about that. Okay, well, I'm asking you to think about it. What's going to happen? Well, I suppose I'm going to have to live with my mum and dad, or I might have to move somewhere else. I think, okay, so then how's that going to affect the family? How's that going to affect the children? You know, it may mess their up the school education and stuff like that. If the, the deep you can go with it, the more that gap expands and the more they see the value in it. And at that point, that's when you introduce the income protection conversation and go, okay, this is scary now. This is a massive gap that you've got, but don't worry, I have something for that. Um, I think too many advisors um, who I've worked with in the past kind of just do that top bit, uh, and, but they don't go down the rabbit hole. And I'm asking people, go down the rabbit hole um, because then you can really, they'll start to see the value. And then uh, again, it doesn't matter what the price is because they see the value in it. It doesn't matter if it's 40, 50 pounds a month because they know they really, really need it uh, and they know they're going to keep it um, for, for years to come. So that would probably be my, my top tip anyway, uh, is, is really, really ask the questions. Yeah, and I think it's it's fair to say, isn't it, that the, the levers that, that work for different clients will be different. Every client is an individual. 100%. For someone, it might be that, you know, the, the car 
monthly car payment has to go for others it might be that the netflix subscription is is uh, in danger so um getting the more you get to know your client the more you'll pick up on what those levers might be um so yeah really good good point there um so finally uh, just before we we wrap up today's session yesterday we mentioned that we're going to be asking everyone across the industry uh, to, to make a pledge to support the objective of Income Protection Awareness Week uh, and increase sales of IP. Um, it's been great to see uh, those appearing on social media across LinkedIn and on Twitter. Um, so I would like to ask each of our panellists here uh, for their pledges and so we can add them to our, our pledge wall. So, so Angela, we'll, we'll come to you first. Um, so from mortgage intelligence point of view, um, we are going to offer over the next year um, sessions that are specific to income protection. And like Sam was saying and Martin was saying, it is about the conversation and going down that rabbit hole. <laughs> and I love um, helping people with the question and techniques um, because it really does take a bit of getting to know what's important to your client to know how you're going to protect what's important to them. Um, so that's what I'm going to be doing is running these sessions for any of our advisors who want to take part, whether they're new to IP or not. Fantastic. Great to hear. Uh, Martin, your pledge. Yeah, it's to increase the number of IP events uh, and increase the uh, website sort of supporting material that we've got. So again, there's there's more um, areas that they can find the information that they need. Fantastic. And finally, Sam. Yeah, for, from my point of view, it's, it's purely to be an open book for advisors. So if anyone needs to contact me for general knowledge about income protection, sales tips, how to question clients, uh, anything at all you need, more than welcome to contact me. We can have a conversation at any time. Fantastic. That's great. And of course, people can get in touch with us and we can, uh, can match you up. That would be fine. Um, we have got a, a number of questions that have come in. What I will say is that because there are quite a number there, um, I will... <laughs> be in touch with the panelists to get their answers and we'll we'll come back to those of you that have asked questions uh, and, and handle those that way um, so that is really all that we have time for today um, I'd like to thank our panel here Angela Martin and Sam and also our contributors earlier in the session to Vincent and to Will Shackleton and to Kate Stratton um, I know it was the Mortgage Strategy Awards last night, um, so congratulations to all the winners. Um, we may have some bleary-eyed mortgage advisors watching today, possibly. Thank you for joining the session today. I hope it's been uh, helpful and inspiring. There'll be more case studies from advisors uh, that we'll be rela releasing later on today. Um, and while you wait for those, you can have a think about your own pledge. Uh, until then, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow on Wealth Wednesday. Thanks all.